move to the other side, right? So this is F DT, and that's gonna be equal to M DV. And then you integrate from one state to another state, one state to state two, and this is what you get. That's it for the derivation. Forces acting over time. Do this. What's this stuff on the right here? What is that? What is this? Fast times velocity. What's that? Nobody? I don't know. Nate Dog, where are you at? No one ain't talking today. That's if you know somebody's name, then, then you know that they're not here. Mark? Or Mark? Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's mass times velocity? Momentum. Yeah. That's right. Mark and Mark got it right. Right? You both, it's you guys, right? You're both Mark, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's momentum, right? You guys remember momentum. It's linear momentum even, actually. We're going to end up with angular momentum a little bit later, right? So that's momentum, right? And so what, our, I guess what we just proved right there was that forces acting over time cause a change in linear momentum. Right. Forces acting over time. Anybody know what that's called? Back to it's physics days. What's that? Yeah, that's, I think I, it's an impulse. Right. An impulse is what we call that. And then mass times velocity here, what we just said was, the, was linear momentum. Impulse. Right. And the reason they're linear impulses because they're just that force is acting over time. Later on, moments acting over time cause like things to rotate, and those are called angular momentum. Usually, <laughs> though, we just call that momentum. But now we're going into a realm where we need to define it more. Okay. Uh, so I'll give you two different kind of versions of momentum. So we got some force acting over time, right? And an impulse, so this is force, what's on this graph right here, right? It's force on that vertical axis and time on the x-axis, right? And so you'd have some force, your force would look like this. And then your impulse is actually, right? This, is, this tells you the area underneath the curve, right? So this would be the area underneath this curve. That would be the impulse. So that, what I have drawn right there, actually has the same impulse, the same effect as something like this. Because what matters is the area underneath. This one has the same net impulse. Uh, the one above time is shortened, so force must be greater to have same energy. This is a thing that's really intuitive to us as well. This is very intuitive to us, right? If some, if the force takes less time, then it has a higher force, right? If the force is spread out more, then, or sorry, if, the, if, yeah, if there's more time associated with this impulse, then the force goes down. We try that again. If they, for the same impulse, the same effect that both of these things have. So if you were in a car and you were heading towards a concrete barrier, right? And if you hit that concrete barrier and the DT is really short, that means the forces are very big. Okay, but if before you hit that concrete barrier, you actually hit water barrels, those water barrels are spreading that time out so that the forces go down, right? Or in high school, I had the opportunity of smashing my face against a windshield once driving without a, I wasn't driving, my buddy was driving without a, I did not have my seatbelt on, and we ran into a septic truck. He was in a Ford Focus, and we hit, went on head, it was luckily he was on a dirt road going 35, but he was in, he was driving a little Ford Focus. I don't know if you saw those things. They're very small little Fords. And we ran into a, a septic pump truck 
coming around a corner on a dirt road and I didn't have my seatbelt on and I got to smash my face against the windshield. That did not feel well. The DT with smashing my face against that window was very, very small, right? And so, the, the, it, it, so then the forces on my face were, were very, very high. And so I had blood dripping down my face. We got in a fight with a highway patrolman. Not real, not physical, but it got close because the, the guy, the way he was taking measure, who, who was at fault is what it came down to. And, it, and I'm pretty sure we were both, or they were, the, two, the driver and the guy were both at fault because they were both crossed the center line. But where he was taking the measurement from was not right. And then me with my engineering mind was just gotten this big argument with this guy. And I, I, I believe I insulted him a few times. And then, he, and, then, and, then, and then he threatened to throw it. Anyways, the DT, the DT was very, very small. You want the DT to be very big. Airbags, right? The whole point of airbags is they pop out. Who would have been great at the time had they had these had these existed? But the DT, they pop out and they increase the amount of time that it takes to slow your face down. And so then the forces on your face are less. Has anybody got hit with an airbag before? It's also not pleasant. Is that is that correct? That's not it's not a pleasant experience, right? What were you doing? What happened? A full on head on. No. Everybody all right? Yeah. Yeah. Because the airbags. Okay. Now you have to, I also expect, uh, uh, share this with you as well. Many years ago, we had this, this Toyota Avalon. And my wife was like, I would like to get, and we have two kids. They were young at the time. I would like to get a new car to be safer. And I'm just like, you have a Toyota Avalon. It's got airbags and shoes back, but there's no side airbags. And I just want something that's safer. I was like, oh my God, all you do is drive around town. Nothing's going to happen. You're fine. We don't need one. So then, so then we had, got a big argument about it. So then we compromised and we got a new car, right? Just, <laughs> that's, that's how it goes, right? I recommend this is works. It, 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 it works well. You compromise, you just let the other person have what they want. Now, now, now so then we did that and she got a, a Honda Pilot that had like all the stuff. Well, no shit. Two weeks later, she was driving down. Uh, oh, she was crossing. Or what's that road by Dairy Queen? It's a, it's a 7th and then the cross street. No, but the one over from Maine, uh, Mendenhall, 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 Mendenhall at 7th, just right in front of Dairy Queen. She's just driving along. Somebody runs a red light, just hit, just nails her from the side, right? Just hits it as a full on T-bone and then boom, all the side impact airbags go. And lo and behold, that fucking side impact airbag probably saved her life. And then my God, it's great. I, I thank God she's still alive. But my God, I told you so that I have to live with the rest of my fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I was like, shit, <laughs> right? That I, this, every time an argument comes up, just remember when the time you said I didn't need these and then, I, and then the airbag saved my life and yeah. Anyways, so airbags, mats, like when, when you're a pole vaulter and you come down on the ground, there's a big mat there. The, big, the purpose of that big mat is to increase that DT so that the forces on you go down, right? It's a very common thing that happens. Okay, so anyways, that's, that's a, 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 a common concept here, okay? Uh, so let's talk about, uh, I, I'm not going to do much with that, but just, just know that like mathematically and, f and with physics, we could show that what's happening there, right? When you slow somebody down there, it, regardless of if it's a windshield or if it's an airbag, right, this has to happen. The mass times velocity has to go from some velocity to no velocity, right? It, it stops. Right, and so then that that the only thing that can happen is right. If straight up, if dt is smaller, then forces go up. If dt is longer, then the forces go down because that equals the same amount no matter what's what you're stopping. Okay, all right. So let's do the conservation of of linear momentum. Okay, so when conservation of linear momentum happens when your impulsive force is zero, right? And so there's two ways that can happen, right? This could be the force is equal to zero. This is a boring one, but. It could be this way, right? There's no forces at all. Right? And so then that's something we'll just have no impulse, right? But it also could be something like this because it's, it's the integral of force over time, right? So it could be like a sine, you know, just something where it cancels, cancels out or a cosine rather or a sine. Let's do sine. Uh oh, right. 
something where the area above is equal to the area afterwards. Right? Either one, you would get an impulsive force. You, you would have uh, linear momentum conserved. I mean, there's no forces acting over time. Okay? And so what we do, if we look at, if we apply that to one particle, so you have one particle flying through the air, right? F dt, right? That's equal to zero. That's what we just said. We're going to get conservation of linear momentum when that happens, which means that's equal to mass times velocity. Same mass because it's only one particle. And so it just says the velocity before is equal to the velocity afterwards, right? So if an impulse came in and applied the load, a sine wave, or if it just wasn't any uh, force at all, the velocity before is equal to the velocity afterwards. This is actually, this is Newton's first law, is that or Newton's third law? Let's see. Is that second? This is Newton's first law. Right? Object in motion stays in motion. Motion. Unless acted on by outside. So I'm just in motion. It's just going to keep going unless it, another force comes in and makes a change. So that's, that one's kind of boring, what's happening with one particle. When you have two particles that collide, right, this is building up to collisions here. We have, right, there's going to be forces that are acting kind of counter to each other. Call this FAB. And this one, F, B, A. Right. These are vectors because they can have X and Y directions associated with them. Right? If these two objects kind of flew into each other, whew, smashed into each other, right? There would be little forces that are acting on, right? B would do something to A and A would do something to B. Okay? Well, how, what's the relationship between these? Huh? <laughs> Let's see here, uh, Mark, or Mark. <laughs> oh, wait, Logan, I got Logan's name too. Well, Logan, what are the, what's the relationship between these two forces? They're equal and yeah, exactly, yep. They're equal and opposite to each other, right? Right? The, what, what law? That's Newton's third law. That's Newton's third law. FAB is equal to FBA, negative FBA. Right? Equal and opposite. The apostrophes here. Third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Isn't that cool that we're using all these laws. This again, this is why I really like mechanics, right? Because everything's like tied back to these laws, right? These laws that cannot be broken, right? They're beautiful, right? You get into concrete, that's not the case. There's a lot of guessing going on in concrete design. And design in general. You, actually, even, even here, within a few minutes here, we're going to start adding empiricism where, where it breaks away from, from that. And we have to we rely on test results. Actually, yeah, right there, right, visible right here. This is empiricism right here. We break away. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to, for this system... For this system, we're just we're just gonna take and we're gonna add these things together. We're gonna take this is this is force this is what B is doing to A, right? And B is gonna change the the momentum of what's happening with A, right? So this force right here is gonna act on A and it's gonna change its momentum. This right here, this force B to A is gonna change the momentum of B. Okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take that guy, and we're going to add it to that guy. And when we do that, right, these guys cancel each other out. Right? Because one's acting one direction and one's acting the other direction. So both of those get added up and we get zero on the left-hand side. Right? And what we're left with is just the stuff that's on the right-hand side. Just this stuff. Okay? And if we rearrange that stuff to talk about what's happening at state one and what's happening at state two, that's all that this next step does. It just kind of rearranges it. This is what we get. We're going to use this guy. 
So my momentum before the collision, mass times velocity of A1. So yeah, basically this is just showing that there's, this guy goes to zero, right? The impulse, the impulsive forces go to zero when it's a system like this. So the mass times velocity of object A plus the mass times velocity of object B is equal to at state one, like before the collision, and then it's equal to the mass times velocities after the collision. Okay. And so if we think about like what's going to happen with this, right? So this is you may have seen this before, but if you think about what's happening with this, right? I'm going to know what's happening before the collision. I'm going to know the velocity of A and the velocity of B before the collision. Right? What I'm after is the velocities after the collision, right, of A and B. The velocities after A and B. The problem with this is, right, I have one equation. This is the only equation I get, right, but I have two unknowns. I have velocity of A afterwards and velocity of B afterwards. Those are two unknowns. I don't know what those things are, right? And, and, and so the, how do I solve this problem? Well, you can't, right? Unless we add some another equation to this, right? We need another equation. That other equation is this coefficient of restitution, right? and this is where empiricism comes in. And this has to do with, right? What it, well, you know, and just to, to take a step back here, right? If this object A was made out of lead, and this object B was made out of steel, right? You can imagine these two things running into each other, right? What would happen? B would, or whichever one was made out of lead, I think A was made out of lead, it's going to deform some, right? The one's coming in, it's going to hit it, and it's going to deform kind of, kind of weird, right? And, and the steel is going to, so how, does it, how do we capture the effect of steel running into a uh, 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 piece of lead? Or what if they were both steel, right? Both steel ball there, just slamming into each other. It's going to be more like, there's going to be more reaction, right? There's going to be more... Uh, I, more energy conserved, really. Right? It's going to hit each other and they're going to bounce off. Or a cue balls hitting each other, right? They're going to bounce off really. But if you have something really soft and something hard that are running into each other, their effect is going to be different, right? And we have to capture that effect in some capacity, right? These different objects hitting each other, right? And the way we do that is with this coefficient of restitution, right? Where this comes from is empiricism. Does anybody know what empiricism means? What's that? Empiricism. You guys ever heard of the empiricism? It shows up in engineering design all the time, right? And this is a, I get the, I get the pleasure of introducing you to empiricism, right? Anybody on the right hand side know what empiricism is? Nobody. Another yawn out. See, you can't yawn every time I look over. You can't. Do, you. Can't. Well, I'm trying to lecture to the right hand side a little. I'm trying to include you guys over here, right? Yeah. Oh, you just look, you're looking at, <laughs> you, you Googled it. I, I, what, the way we use it in engineering context is we don't know, so we're going to do a bunch of tests, and the results of those tests is what we're going to put in there. So it's based off of, off of test results, right? And so what they, you can imagine, somebody's like, ha, I wonder how, you know, a lead ball runs into a steel ball. I wonder how, how, how much, like, how the reactions behave there. So what they do is they get a lead ball and a steel ball, and they start throwing them at each other and seeing what happens. Right, and then and then they're like, oh, what happens if two wood balls run each other? Well, let's get two wood balls and let's throw them at each other, right? And let's see what happens, right? Or in in structural engineering context, you're like, I wonder how strong that reinforced concrete beam is. How about we build one and we or a bunch of them and we'll break a bunch of them and then we'll try to come up with these equations based off of mechanics. But if the, if we can't explain it with mechanics, let's just tie it into the test results. Well, we we tested a thousand of these and this is what we got the, for a minimum shear stress. And so we say that's the minimum shear stress in design. Right, and that's and so it's based off of test results, right? Which is a little, which is a little weird. I don't like it because it's because you, once you start doing that, then Newton's laws fall away, right? We, you, you can't tie these coefficients of restitution back to Newton's laws. We're just we're just guessing. We're just throwing things at each other. We're testing it to see how it behaves. Here, you get, look at that. I taught you guys something today. Okay, so these are material specific. Right? These coefficients of restitution are material specific, not just not just uh, not just each material, but the two types of materials that are hitting each other: lead versus steel, versus rubber, versus wood. Right? They're material specific. 
e equal to 1. Uh oh. What is it doing? It keeps telling me. It's giving me automatically. I don't want that. 1 is elastic collision. In this case, kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is conserved. In a collision, this brings a good point. In a, in a typical collision, is energy conserved? Yes. No. Really? Yeah. Isn't that blow, does that blow your mind? In a general collision, energy, and, and if think about it, go back to the example of the lead ball and the steel ball, right? The steel ball slams into the lead ball, right? And the lead ball deforms. What happens if the lead ball deforms? Right? Heat's being dissipated in, in, that, in that yielding that's happening and stuff, right? And, or come picture back to the car, right? To my wife getting hit on the side for the car, right? right? With the car crumpled when she, got, when she got hit from the side and it deformed and, and, and elements were yielding with inside that, that, that uh, the structure of the car, right? And all that, there's energy being dissipated, right? But no matter, but this is what's so sick about this concept. No matter how much energy is dissipated in a collision, no matter what, momentum is conserved. Isn't that fucking, isn't that fucking weird? Like it's a, it's a, we just proved that, that 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 happens here. It almost seems magical. It almost seems magical. It's even more magical when we start getting into angular momentum. But I really like it because it is no matter what, no matter what, it's conserved. But energy is not conserved. I will tell you this: if you have a collision problem, I'm going to state this many times. If you have a collision problem and you say before the before the collision, this is the energy, and then after the collision, this is the energy the exact same energy, you set them equal to, and you skip that linear momentum part middle, zero. I won't even grade it, okay? Do not, it is not conserved. It is not conserved, unless, unless, unless you have a pure elastic collision where your, your uh, E is equal to one, right? What's also pretty cool, but this isn't real. This isn't real, right? There's no such thing as a, a perfectly elastic collision. Uh, I'll show you a YouTube video in a second where they, we got as close as we can to this. Now, the other thing I was going to mention, what's really cool about this too, is you can, if you do the collision between two objects, right, and then you see, you know, you could look at, it, you, you say energy, or sorry, momentum is conserved across that. You can then, after the fact, go back and calculate how much energy was lost during that collision, right? Because you could do it, right? You have, you have the, the linear momentum that carries you across the collision and then you just calculate the energy before and you calculate the energy afterwards and you see that they're different and you can actually quantify that. And so with linear momentum, you can quantify how much energy was lost during the whole deforming of the side of the car and all that stuff. It's, it, it's fascinating to me. Okay, so in this, but this is fictional. Right. I think you have one problem where you do a coefficient restitution. For most part, we're gonna, I, God dang it. It's being too smart here. E, in, e is, in fact, equal to 2.7. Uh, zero is a plastic collision. I think all the problems we do have, have plastic collisions, and this is where they stick together. Right? If two objects run into each other, and then they stick together, and they stick together, then they're considered... Uh, a, pl a perfectly plastic collision, right? So slams into it. Most of our problems, we're going to do this, right? Which just means, you know, I guess this would mean that V A 2 is equal to V B 2. Right? And this equation up here, by saying it's a plastic collision, it's just saying that this is equal to this because they're stuck together. So those two can come together. And then now you could solve that problem. If they're stuck together, then they move the same afterwards. The only unknown you have is what's the velocity of both of them afterwards together, right? And so you have, you, and, and you could solve it because you have, you have one equation and one unknown and you could solve it, All right? And the last thing, let's just define this. It's empirically der derived. based on a bunch of tests.
trend lines. I don't like it. Like in our in our pure in our pure mechanics class so far, everything's been tied back to that. And this is a one little glimpse of empiricism that, that's in there. Right? So I, I actually don't spend too much time on it. So your answer right there ends up being somewhat of a guess. Okay, before I get into that, let's look at some YouTube. We miss YouTube Friday, right? So let's. This is what they call the atomic trampoline. This guy's an interesting character. I like showing this video just because this guy is interesting. So here's an astonishing bit of physics. Fairly recently discovered, we've got two plastic tubes with lumps of metal in the bottom and little ball bearings. And when you put one of the ball bearings in, it forms like that. Nothing very exciting happens. However, this one here has got a layer of some exotic chemical they call, well, they call it an atomic trampoline. You'll see why in a moment. But it's a liquid metal, a morphous structure, with nickel, titanium, zirconium, beryllium, copper in it. And unlike this one, it doesn't convert the impact, the energy of the impact, into heat energy, which this one does, or hardly any of it, so that it throws the ball back up in the air. And it does an incredible amount of time. Well, it goes faster and faster. I had a recent discovery about 1993, I think, we came out of the California Institute of Technology. And the atomic trampoline, what a, what a suitable name for it, and what a performance. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so that, you can see clearly there the difference in the coefficient of restitution, right? The, one on the, the first one that he did had one that was closer to zero, right? And it closer to zero, so less energy is conserved. And, it, and, and it, it dissipates really quickly because, again, inside that, even though that ball, ball is going to be totally fine, there is a little bit of molecules moving by each other, and then that's causing dissipation of energy, right? And then in the other one, on the, uh, the second one that he did, right, it just preserved that energy longer. It still lost it, right? It still lost it. I, I'd be interesting if they made, I think it's a regular steel ball that they had drop. drop the, the special thing was on the coating of the thing that was dropping off of. Like, if they made the ball out of the same material, That'd be kind of cool. And then they vacuumed it. I think then you could really, you could, you could really show that how close it is. I mean, theoretically, right? If you had a coefficient rest equal one, you'd take it, you'd drop it in there, and it would just continue to drop like that forever, right? Which would be really cool. Like I'd like that for my desk, right? Just no energy input into it, and it just like, no, no, anybody, that's it. just forever, just sits there. What's that called? That's uh, what's that called? Perpetual motion, perpetual motion, perpetual motion. If you guys could make me one of those, that'd be great. Uh, let's see here. I got this guy again here. This is this guy, same guy. I asked a friend of mine, Clive Panther, to come along and demonstrate something which he says is well worth seeing. So I'm looking forward to it. Clive, what have you got for us? It's um, a lung capacity tester based on an implement that was apparently used by Welsh miners to test whether their lungs were strong enough to go underground. What oh, you have to do is just blow very hard and see if you can get this windmill to go around. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, well, you've yes. got to blow very hard. Give it a try, Tim. Uh, well, it's made of brass. I can't see, but I'll have a go. Here we go. Ah, well, um, that didn't happen to you, but it happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good time. Right? That's, uh, that's funny. Okay. He, if you rewatch it, the guy's face is on the left. He's just like, he knows it's coming. He thinks it's funny. Yeah, okay. That's what, all right, let me get so this, so this is impact. Right? So let me show you some impact. I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, there's some cool... It, hurt, it, hurts, it hurts for me to say this. But mechanical engineering has some cool stuff happening. This is an old, obviously an old video. So this is going to show you these. Remember before, remember before, remember before, when we said, like, 
the slinky, right? The slinky thing about how that wave propagation is slow. And then if you can, uh, you know, the, the bottom didn't know what happened to the top because it had the wave, the information hadn't been transferred to it. That, oh, by the way, you've been dropped. And I mentioned that there's, that's what they use. That's the, the idea behind these like armor penetrating uh, 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 ammunition, right? And this is kind of a demonstration of it. And once it strikes the side of the steel plate, the back of it doesn't know that it's been struck yet or had that it struck something and so it just keeps it keeps plowing through it right and so this is kind of the visual representation of what that looks like right so it's going so fast that it just continues to penetrate through the side of this thing right and actually right now right now right across the hall right underneath the I don't know if you mechanical, right across next to the, uh, the, the lame concrete canoe, right? <laughs> Literally, there's a concrete canoe. If you look behind the concrete canoe and through that window, there's this big, huge gun that was made, that was made for specifically testing these rods for uh, Los Alamos National Lab. They, they sponsored a, it was a senior design group from a couple of years ago that designed this thing and they actually made it. And, they ha and, and, and they're, they're launching these rods at a steel plate with uh, air pressure. They're building up a thousand PSI and then I think they're gonna get up to like 5,000 PSI and they release it all at once and it pushes these these rods forward and it goes and it slams into a little steel plate. And then on the other end, there's this big steel containment thing that, that tried to prevent it from like blowing up and killing students and stuff. But, but it's over there right now and they're gonna start using it more because that's the reason it was built was to test that, that aspect of, and, and so he showed me one of like the objects that they had shot at it. And you could see that they said that that one failed because in the front of it was mushroomed and the back of it was mushroomed, which means that it didn't hold, it didn't hold. They want the back to be perfectly elastic still and the front of it to be mushroomed. But in this case it failed because the back had, had mushroomed as well. And so right here at MSU, we're testing ballistics. Right? And so there you've got to demonstrate this idea of, oh, put a tail on it, that'd be great. But it has to push against something. That explosion or that pressure has to push against something. So does everybody know what that's called right there? A sabo. In the back, these sabos are sick. Right? <laughs> they just, it's, it's something for that pressure, right? Even when you shoot a regular gun, what's causing it to fly forward is actually an air pressure, right? There's an explosion and there's an air pressure that's pushing it. And it's something has to catch that air pressure. And it's this sabo. What a cool name, Sable. And then you got rifling in there too to put in some stability. We'll learn about that later, how that's adding stability to the system. Right? And it comes out and it's like not gonna fly straight, so they eject the Sable. Does that thing fly? Hey, <laughs> those are concrete walls. I got one here. I think I got some others where it's flying through a. Through cars, right? You see, it passed. It passed clearly through that car, and then the car reacted, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's see, you got another one here. I thought there's one where it show, throws shows it throwing going through a bunch of steel plates. Maybe not. Okay, no, that one's it. I got a couple, I got another one. They, 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 what's really cool to me is that they can film these things flying through the air. Is that cool that they could do that? Just, just, just the camera work even, right? Right. Yeah, six thousand frames per second. Ejects that sabo. Yeah. All right. I got a couple more here. Yeah. A good job should not require a college degree. John Foster gets it. John Fox. Oh my God. So we can get the job training we need to build a career. Or to stay in Montana. I'm so sick of these. He only cares about fighting for Montana.
So, just a rail guns. Rail guns are sick, right? And it's propulsion mechanism in railgun. Instead of an explosion with air pressure behind it, it is magnets, right? So they have these big electromagnets that, that you know, they, they fire up and, it, and then, you know, traveling currents cause magnetic uh, forces and there's a, and then it just shoots the projectile out at, at incredibly high, uh, high velocities. Right, and so this is a railgun, and they shoot similar artillery as well. I did a video called U.S. Navy Railgun. Right, that comes out of a railgun. Video. It shows a railgun firing a projectile going lengthways across the screen at up to Mach 7. Yet in the footage, it looks like the camera is panning around and following the projectile the whole way. Since I made that video, I had more than a few people ask the question, how can a camera track a projectile moving so fast? Which is a valid question, and I myself wanted to know the answer, so I investigated how it's done, and here's what I found out. The camera filming the projectile works by having a computer-controlled high-speed rotating mirror in line of sight of a high-speed camera. The high-speed so mirror rotating, tracks and follows but, the projectile, keeping it in the center of the I don't care about that, I want to see it just blown up. For up to I, I will say that, right, so... I, I, I'm a gun owner. I've been a hunter all my life and all this stuff, right? But, like, this argument about, like, we need our guns to fight back against the government. Look what they fucking have, right? <laughs> Look what they have. They got drones. They got, they got artillery. They, they have artillery. They shoot from a drone that, that, that these big blades come out and chops your head off and stuff, right? You ain't got it, right? Like, and there was, I, saw, I saw, like, a comedy thing the other day that was talking about, like, that once a year they should put, you know, an, a heavily armed militia of like 100 people versus a guy with a drone, right? And just show like what would happen, right? Like, like you got nothing. You got nothing on that, right? This is, you, would you see what it is that they have, Relaying right? Relaying those images back to the camera. You see, now, they have. I do not know which camera was used in the filming of the railgun projectile tests. I could not find that information. The first camera is called the Handler Mini Flight. I don't care about those. That's... But looks Anyways. different from the Handler. That's pretty cool that you can track those things. Right. And the rail guns. Pretty neat. Okay. Back to this. All right. So collisions. Right. But I thought that was pretty neat because just last week is when I, they wanted us to move our canoe. They wanted us to move our canoe so that they could see the gun. So you guys could walk by and see the gun in there. But if you do, you look over there, you'll see it's big. It's a big, long uh, steel tube, basically, is what it looks like. But that's the whole purpose of it, is to shoot rods at a steel plate to see how well uh, uh, the, the, what they're shooting it behaves. They're testing the projectiles in that case. All right. Uh, this, let's do this one on Wednesday. So we'll... we'll, we'll yeah, we'll start this one. We'll start right now. It's five minutes to it. I know, I know. You gotta do it. We'll get it. Otherwise, I'm gonna fall behind. I'm gonna rush later, stuff like that. All right. Let's give you an example of the type of problems we're gonna solve. All right? We have a 10 pound package that's at the top of the shoe. I, I like to use it this way because I think just a plain old. I, I guess one other comment to make is these things. This is. This is a vector equation. Actually, let's do that. Let's let's explain this. This is a vector equation. Right, unlike you know work energy, which was just a scalar equation, this is a vector equation, which means that you can have three directions to this. You can have the x, the y, and z. So when I said there's only when I before when I was like, oh, there's one equation and 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 one equation and two unknowns. There's actually one, two, three equations: the x, y, and z direction in, in these things. And then you have. Uh, the, the X, Y, and Z movement on the other side. So there's a lot of unknowns and stuff that's happening. So a lot of times they apply this problem. You may have done this in physics. Had to do with like a Q, like I think a pool's a pool is a perfect example. Like where you have a ball that has a velocity in like the Y direction. It, you know, it's going up like this. Where it has, it's coming in like this, right? And then it's going to strike a wall like this. And then what you could do is then apply this methodology to determine, right, what its trajectory is going to be after the fact, right? There is no force in the y direction, so it keeps going in the y direction, but there will be a change in velocity in the x direction, right? So you, you would apply that this methodology in both directions. The book kind of gets into that. I don't, I don't use it this way, but, but just to point out that that's how you would solve those collision type problems is you would look in the X, you might have one of your homeworks like this. Uh, I can't remember, but it, but it has, 
you know, you would look at, you would apply this methodology in the y direction, and then you would apply this methodology in the x direction, right? In the x direction, there is a collision that's taking place in the y direction, there's not, so it keeps going with the same velocity in the y direction, but the x direction velocity changes. And so that's how you would have these, these are, these are called oblique impacts. Oblique impacts, right? We're, what we're going to use these things for are this type of problem, right? So in this particular case, we have an object A. It's coming down this ramp, to, and it's going to strike B. What kind of problem is that going to be before the striking? It's just work energy, right? It's, it's got potential energy. It's coming down, and then that potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. Then the collision is going to take place. In collision, that energy is not conserved. So you're going to have uh, uh, impulse momentum, right? Conservation of momentum across the collision. And then after that, the thing is going to slide across the ground. Uh, and then that's going to be a work energy again. So it's going to be like a three-part problem. It's going to be a combination between the two, right? So we're going to do work energy, impulse momentum, work energy. And, and I'll, I'll show you how to lay those things out. I think it's what makes it a little bit more interesting to, to throw it in there. What you cannot do, this is what I was saying before, what you cannot do is say, I'm going to look at the energy, the total potential energy up here, and then that's going to be equal to uh, the work done down below. It's going to be, I'm going from state A to, or state one to state three, and then the energy is conserved, and it's not. That, that's an automatic no point if you do that, right? Because there's a collision. Because there's a collision. And the collision takes energy out of the system. And then after the fact, once we figure this out, we can come back and calculate how much energy was lost across that collision, right? It's kind of fun. Is it fun? It's fun. We'll say it's fun. Okay. That's all I had.